thank you for coming to this uh, session. We've just concluded the ninth session of the trilateral uh, dialogue between USA, Japan and India, which is a track to dialogue, non-official, non-government. And this has been a six-year process which started in 2006 in Washington, D.C. And we thought it would be useful to share uh, some of our perceptions, some of our conclusions with a wider audience and also to respond to questions and comments uh, from participants. N.K., please come up. You are the you are the original pioneer of the Indo-Japan relationship. The Chen K. Singh member of parliament. Um, we have a great uh, panel. We had to select two from each team uh, for this uh, session. Uh, but there are many others from the participants who are here and who are not on the dais. Uh, each one uh, experienced, knowledgeable and eminent, uh, but I will not call out all their names. Let me introduce the panel in one go and then uh, put a round of questions to them to kick off, kick off this session. Uh, first, Secretary Armitage, uh, who uh, I'm not sure whether he needs introduction to an Indian audience. <laughs> We've had, uh, we've had a lot to do with him over the years. Uh, he's been the U.S. Uh, Deputy Secretary of State. I remember at that time we hosted him in this hotel uh, in, in a session uh, where uh, we, we discussed uh, Indo-U.S. relations, which were a little rocky at, 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 at that time, uh, much better now. Um, but he is an outstanding thought leader. Um, highly decorated by not just the US but by many many countries for his uh, contribution and his services. Uh, he has a particularly long association with the defense and security areas and we are very fortunate that he leads the American delegation, he is the co-chair and uh, he is here with us today. Thank you Secretary Armitage. The co-chair and the leader from the Japanese side is uh, Kasai-san. Mr. Kasai is uh, chairman of uh, Japan Central Railway, which is the company which runs the bullet trains in Japan. But he is uh, much more than a business leader uh, for me and for all of us who have had the privilege of working with him over the last six years in this trilateral. Uh, he is a deep thinker and speaker he believes in a strong Japan, as, as we all do, and uh, as co-chair of the trilateral uh, dialogue, his leadership has been quite unique and uh, extremely important in taking this process uh, forward. Gautam Thapar, a business leader from India, probably needs a uh, little introduction to an Indian audience. Um, chairman of Aspen India, just completed his chairmanship of the All India Management Association, globalizing, thinking, um, moving his group ahead uh, rapidly, but also uniquely, I think the first business leader who is a member of the National Security Board. Uh, this is quite unprecedented in, in uh, India where the National Security Board has been a preserve of uh, non-industry, non-business people. So, Gautam, good to, good to have you here. Uh, Mike Green, formerly of the White House, uh, now with the CSIS, holding the Japan chair. I would say the architect and the coordinator of this trilateral dialogue. He is the brain trust. Uh, he keeps us going. He gently directs us in different ways and uh, he's been an enormous source of strength in moving this process forward. Uh, deep knowledge of Japan, speaks Japanese fluently, 
I, I can go on and on, but, but he's just a remarkable person <laughs> to, to, to have him. Uh, Tani Guchi san, uh, a former government official of the Japanese government, now a professor at uh, different universities, uh, writer, author, uh, again extremely intellectual in his perception, so it will be very happy to hear from him how he sees the trilateral. And finally, uh, Ambassador Eamon Singh, uh, retired as uh, Ambassador to Japan uh, recently, now with the ICREA uh, holding a chair in Indo-US relations, which is the Vandwani chair, um, again has been a great support to us in this trilateral process when he was Ambassador in Tokyo and now as a participant and, and a, you know, a driver of this whole process of bringing the three countries together. So let me begin with you, Secretary Armitage, you know, put you in the hot seat as it were. Why this trilateral? Why Japan, India and the US together? I mean, well, is there something unique about these countries or is it just about China? Is it a negative thing that we are doing? Is it a positive thing that we are doing? Uh, how do you see this? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Das. First of all, let me thank our uh, Indian friends for a fine hosting job and we're so happy. I'm sure in this case I'm speaking for the Japanese side to meet back in Delhi. And it occurred to me, Tarun, when you said that you picked two from each side. Actually, I would say we have six on the same team. <laughs> because that's, that's what we've seen, I think, through this dialogue. He asked the direct question, why this dialogue? Well, wouldn't it be unusual for the largest liberal democracy, the second largest liberal democracy, the fourth largest uh, liberal democracy in the world not to have this kind of conversation? After all, we share a lot of common interests and needs, uh, energy security. Uh, Indo-Pacific maritime security. We uh, share a need that uh, you know, the same need in the uh, to see that the global uh, economy uh, comes back on its feet and steps up. And it's not about China, uh, except except I think all of us accept the view that China's peaceful re-rise can best be accomplished in a region which is rooted in strong prosperous democracies. So it's not against China, actually, you can say it's, it's, it's part of its goal is to see the China rise in a peaceful and prosperous way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary. Let me turn now to Kasai-san. Kasai-san, uh, for decades, Japan was governed by one political party. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last two years, we have seen another political party, the DPG, DPJ, mm -hmm. uh, in, in charge having won the elections. How do you see, I, I mean, seeing several changes in Prime Minister uh, from Japan, how do you see Japanese politics? How do you see Japan evolving? What's happening in Japan? And uh, how do you see your way forward on, the, on economy and energy issues? You've had a great tragedy in Fukushima. You've had a great tragedy with the tsunami and the whole world shares your sorrow and your grief and what you have been through. But will you share with us some of your thoughts about Japan? Mm. During the uh, few decades uh, of the Cold War period, Japan enjoyed a very, I think, stable situation under the leadership of uh, USA, because the world is, I think, a framework by the two groups, USA and South Asia. And Japanese, uh, I think, uh, strong point is work very uh, uh, diligent with discipline and make a good uh, product. And it functions very well. And uh, after uh, the end of the war, Japan was totally destroyed. Uh, but uh, in a few decades, Japan uh, go, grew uh, to a uh, number two uh, free world economic power. And it was not because Japanese politics are very good at uh, strategic, uh, strategical decision making, but also it decided to belong to the free and democratic and uh, 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 maritime uh, allies 
with USA. But at the time of the collapse of, uh, since the time of collapse of Soviet uh, Russia, the world framework was lost. And the um, world just come into the area uh, where the map is not uh, prepared. And so the leadership of politics is really needed since 1990-something 90, 90 to now. Uh, but I think uh, because Japan has never uh, very well, I think, experienced to make, to look at the reality and to uh, judge with their own risk and take risk and uh, promote a policy. Therefore, I think Japanese politics uh, look like uh, be lost, at a loss. And uh, it makes the long-lasting uh, LDP government, government of Japan uh, make, I think, look like obsolete and weak. And so people are uh, accustomed, uh, have had enough of LDP's way of doing, and just expected the change and chose DPJ. And during the Cold War time, to leave, uh, to give up LDP means to, to choose socialist or communist. It is totally unrealistic. But after uh, the end of the Cold War, uh, it looked like not very much different from DPJ fundamentally. And the LDP fundamentally and DPJ might be able to do something new that is good to Japanese politics. But uh, since it become a government party, it has been betraying, betraying the expectation of Japan. So now, Japan is oh, again, uh, I think, confused and at a loss. And Noda, Prime Minister Noda, is very good in his thinking. Uh, but I think His party is not integrated very well and strong enough to promote, to realize his idea. And while the other, uh, well, uh, Japan, uh, after uh, the Cold War time, now world is entering into the new uh, phase of the 21st century. 21st century framework of the international society, international politics is not yet, but now it is coming to uh, run into the uh, home stretch to the 21st century framework. And USA decided to uh, make Asia Pacific Indian Ocean area uh, the most important uh, place of American uh, policy, international policy. And so the world moving toward a new regime. That is, uh, USA, Pacific Ocean, a free democratic uh, TPP group versus uh, China, that is uh, expanding, becoming more ambitious and becoming more strong. So in order to uh, meet that situation, uh, it is very meaningful that the USA, India, Japan, have a very close relationship. And before the government uh, uh, started the trilateral meeting uh, of this uh, uh, group, started was very meaningful. It was by the initiative of CSIS and <coughs> the uh, Industrial Legal India. And now I think that substance is following us. That's my idea. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Both of you come from a different background, uh, the business uh, you know, background. Um, you are doing business with the US, I know, and you've been participating in our meetings in Japan. Um, how do you see the trilateral? Uh, what's the Indian business perspective on the trilateral? <laughs> Uh, 
energy security, all of these issues are no longer just issues that governments have to deal with. The private sector has to deal with these issues and they plan their own growth going uh, forward. Uh, you know, as the country moves forward, uh, the search for technology, uh, the search for securing our energy needs, uh, the search for deepening our capital markets, the search for mobilizing resources, all of these things are becoming vitally important in a business planning process as well. And uh, looking at the relationship that uh, looking at the, looking at the uh, so looking at the relationship that's been built, looking at the openness of the discussion, I think the, uh, a bigger convergence of understanding of, uh, of what each of the three countries have to offer each other, but also what all three of them bring to the region is equally important and for, you know, for any businessman looking at business opportunities within that framework is equally important as well as contributing to issues that affect, to my mind, India's long-term national security uh, going forward. So to me, the process has been very interesting uh, from that point of view. Uh, and I think that uh, if you look at increasing participation in the Indian economy, uh, the numbers that we are seeing both of companies out of Japan investing in India, companies out of the United States investing in India, uh, are actually a vindication of the process that we started uh, uh, six years ago. Thank you. Mike, you are the creator of this process. You gave birth to it. You are the mother. You are the mother hen. Uh, has it, and today the governments are, are following in this process. They've had their first trilateral meeting in December in DC. We hear the second meeting is in Tokyo in, in April. Uh, what's your vision? What, what's your thought process? Uh, you know, what would you like to say on this whole issue? And, uh, disappointing, <laughs> positive, good, bad, where do you come from? Well, this um, trilateral concept um, in some ways, it goes back to the beginning of the Bush administration with Rich Armitage and Corporal Patterson, who was my boss at the time, and, and those of us who went in government thought we needed to conceive of Asia uh, more broadly. Um, and, 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 and in effect, we discovered the linkages between East Asia and South Asia as we thought about what Ambassador Armitage called the re rise of China. Um, we never had a government trilateral. Uh, in those years, um, uh, and uh, so when we left government, we created a second track, and it has been very gratifying to see that the Obama administration has um, created now a first track trilateral, which I think indicates um, some of the bipartisan support in the U.S. behind both the U.S.-India and the U.S.-Japan relationships. Um, we very consciously, in the Bush administration, premised our Asia strategy on a transformed relationship <coughs> with India and a revitalized alliance with Japan. And at the end of eight years, I think most China experts in both parties in the U.S., and most Chinese would say, we had a very good, very strong relationship with China. We had challenges, which we were candid about, but we had basically a stable relationship. And I think that shows this is not a zero-sum thing. Um, and in fact, as countries grow up and try to find what will the institutional architecture be in Asia and globally, there is naturally going to be a certain amount of hedging or caucusing with like-minded states. Uh, we may have a U.S.-Japan-China trilateral at some point, uh, or a U.S.-India-China uh, trilateral, or maybe even a Japan-India-China trilateral. What makes this one unique, though, is that we start from very similar values and interests, and we've grown very comfortable together. What I'd like to see next, speaking personally, others in our delegations will have different views. Um, I think we need... Um, uh, much more active coordination um, as we go into um, meetings like the East Asia Summit, where U.S., Japan, and India are all core members, but the hosts are, are rather small countries with limited capacity, um, and we should go into those thinking about what the agenda should be and, and making sure there's progress. Uh, very gratifying to see Japan, India, defense cooperation increasing with regular um, naval exercises and with Malabar now uh, regularly bringing U.S., Japanese, Indian navies together. Maybe the next area to think about is with Japan's changes in defense export rules, some more collaboration on technology and, uh, and, and uh, uh, capacity uh, building. So I think um, the trust is there. Um, 
we all have our uh, bureaucratic challenges at home and our political uh, challenges, but I think the trust is there, and these are the kind of concrete areas we should explore. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Kari Gujistan, you've been with us uh, all through the process. <coughs> um, would you like to add something to what Kasai San said, as your perspective on the bilateral? Um, to follow on what you have heard from uh, Matt Green, I, I, let me just say we have a five member network. We need to have um, 10 bilateral channels. If you have a 10 member network, it's going to be 45. And if, that, if you have a 20 member network, such as G20, you need to have 195 bilateral channels. So, in order for the multilateral level framework to function well, you need to have a core group. And so the Indians and Japanese and Americans are perfectly fit to uh, push the evolving Malta frameworks <coughs> forward because we're all like-minded peers. So key word, the like-mindedness, is something that binds as a common thread with all the discussions we have had over the last six years. And uh, let me just say a couple words about its historical background. It was Tarandas' initiative, being aware that there has got to be a link, powerful link, that binds two democracies in Asia together. India, the biggest democracy, Japan, the proud old democracy in Asia, together. And then he approached Secretary Army Page <coughs> to relay his ambition to the Japanese side, which fell on the court of uh, Mr. Kasai. That started, has been this process, and let me just only say, it's been an immensely helpful opportunity for us, for the Japanese side. It's been like going through a graduate school, if you like, <laughs> to know uh, what's in mind among the Indians, what's the value for both of us, for, 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 for all of us, to speak with one voice, on the same page. And it's been extremely fortunate, I have to say, that the political process has e evolved in pretty much along the same line. If you recall, uh, President Clinton's icebreaking visit was followed by Prime Minister Mori's visit to Japan, and that was followed right after we it launched this process in 2007 by uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's visit to India, where he made his uh, most artic articulate speech entitled Confluence of the Two Seas. Ladies and gentlemen, this Confluence of the Two Seas is another one that binds all these countries together. And uh, the more we learn about the, ourselves, the more convinced have we become of the value of us continuing to speak like this. Thank you very much. That was so well put. Outstanding. Hemant, you've been doing a lot of work in this area. You've been thinking about the regional architecture for Asia. You've made presentations on all these issues recently. Would you like to come in? I'd just like to uh, thank you, Tarun. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, it, I'm in agreement with all the previous speakers. But uh, to take a look at uh, what's driving this process, the first uh, thing which comes to mind is convergence. These convergences really started about a decade ago and they built up first with the United States and then they built up with, uh, with Japan. And uh, eventually we decided that uh, if we were able to work together, we might be uh, able to expand our bilateral agendas in, into something wider, which was going to have a beneficial impact on the whole region. And that was the start of this <coughs> idea. And I, I must say that Tarun, it was with so much foresight that we took this forward at the high point of our strategic engagements with these two countries, where we were really sort of, uh, where everything was coming together. And uh, the, since then, the developments have just uh, uh, borne, you, uh, borne out the fact that you were quite right in starting this. The governments have started a track one initiative uh, uh, recently. Now, what, do, what is happening for India? Because none, none of these uh, things would have a meaning unless we in India understand uh, the developments uh, better. Firstly, in 2005, India became a member of the East Asia Summit. That was a momentous change as far as we were no longer uh, away from Asia, we were a part of Asia. And 
that started a completely new chapter in what we used to call the, the look east approach. The second uh, dynamic which developed uh, in recent years is the fact that we are looking at a nation century. What does it mean to look at a nation century? Uh, half the world's GDP over the next 40 years, by 2050, half the world's GDP will just be accounted for by this region. And just seven of these countries, including India, will contribute 45% of world GDP by then. Uh, that obviously means that uh, uh, all three, uh, we join Japan and the United States in having a stake in uh, regional economic architecture, in regional security architecture, in contributing to these architectures. And thirdly, the third development is that uh, with this progression from uh, looking at uh, East Asia separately, South Asia separately, other, other uh, uh, geographical constructs. We've evolved into an Indo-Pacific construct. And that is, a, that, that is a proper, appropriate, geostrategically more appropriate construct for what we can do together and, and where our main focus of attention will be. And uh, now, uh, to, to just to to take this forward, I think our contributions to uh, this Indo-Pacific framework have started. The United States have, uh, has recently announced a rebalancing towards Asia, which is, which is welcome. India is looking at closer ties with on both uh, economic integration and maritime security and other issues with East Asia. Japan has uh, strengthened its security posture in recent years. Our defense collaborations have grown in, uh, between uh, our countries. So, the progression from now onwards will be to consolidate our bilateral partnership, uh, to give strength and ideas to those who lead our track one uh, processes, and uh, make this really one of the most uh, stable factors for crafting an Asia which is, which is stable, which is strategically balanced, and where uh, strategic competition does not override economic interdependence. Thank you, thank you very much. Secretary Amitesh, uh, Hemad just talked about defense collaboration and that's your area of you know, long, long time expertise and knowledge. Are we doing enough in defense collaboration? Um, are the three countries on the same page on defense collaboration? Are we still to get there uh, over a period of time? Is it of very Indo-US defense collaboration is a very recent origin. Uh, Japanese-US collaboration is, is, is a long time thing. Uh, how do you see the whole area of defense collaboration which is so critical to national and international security? Well, thank you, Jared. Uh, I say regarding the US and India, uh, you're right. Uh, I do go back away and so I'm a little disappointed. I'll tell you why. It hasn't got anything to do with procurements from the United States or anything like that. In 1983, we were, at that time, the state of our relationship, we were able to have the collaboration on the light combat aircraft. And I was hopeful in 1983, if we could do that then, then how far ahead should we be now? But we haven't made the progress in the best cooperation that we should have. I think we're, we're moving ahead. We're getting there. In Japan, there, because of the... Uh, three principles on export controls of defense articles, which have just recently been relaxed, there's been, of course, an obvious reluctance to get involved. Now that is relaxed, and I think that will have, uh, or will lead to rather rich and fruitful uh, India-Japan uh, cooperation. Japan and the United States, which is a unique relationship, uh, we did have carve-outs uh, from the three principles on export control, particularly for missile defense. Uh, and on some defense technologies, which was, to be clear about it, extraordinarily meaningful, particularly during the end of the Cold War, as the then Soviet Union was faced with the specter of the two most technologically advanced countries in the world cooperating together on defense technology. So, it's a mixed picture. But as we saw, I think, over our discussions yesterday and today, Carol, uh, the clear desire of all three sides is to increase this cooperation and put real wind in the sails of defense uh, collaboration. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I did this round with the panel so that you get a sense of what people are thinking here. Um, 
I'd like to open it out now to the to the audience. And uh, if, with your permission, sir, I'd like to start with Mr. N. K. Singh because he kind of goes back uh, and has been a central figure, especially in Indo-Japan relations. And then, as the secretary to the prime minister, was instrumental in in driving the Indo-US relationship. So NK, can I give you the floor for a couple of minutes with any thoughts you'd like to share, any questions you want to put? You want to be the devil's advocate? Um, well, I think that, thank you. Uh, any, and you're sitting in parliament now. <laughs> thank you, Karen. Uh, uh, I think that I have one uh, comment and perhaps a suggestion. Uh, the comment which I have is that in the five years which I worked in Japan, lived in Japan, and did try to foster Indo-Japanese uh, economic cooperation, and some of these automobile uh, uh, collaborations were a product of that time in which we were beginning to break out. One of the factors which was in the Japanese psyche was that historically India had had an uneven relationship with the United States and that we were far too close to the Soviet axis of power. And I think that this was a very important handicap in being able to overcome a, a, a psyche on which there was a legacy and on which we found ourselves uh, in a somewhat difficult position. Now I think that the fact that we have traversed a long distance and that we are having this trilateral cooperation, nothing could be a greater vindication that hopefully that embedded psyche has been now put to rest and I thought that I would just make this comment. I think that in terms of the suggestion, uh, I think that uh, uh, Michael and uh, Gautam both raised uh, an important issue I think which is worth carrying forward. That one of the tangible outcomes apart from reshaping the way in which we look at this evolving architecture of cooperation in this region is that if there could be one or two powerful tangible ideas where we can shape an outcome which will make a decisive difference in life quality. I think if we craft one or two of those tangible ideas it could really lend much greater credence to this ongoing dialogue. Now here's my suggestion. Uh, you know, uh, Kasai san uh, 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 when your Prime Minister was here recently, I had the opportunity of a bilateral call on him, uh, along with uh, my Chief Minister, Mr. Nidish Kumar. And one of the ideas which fascinated him was what Japan can do to change the ecology and environment of this region by perhaps bringing in Nepal and the whole ecological management of the Himalayas into stronger focus. And he was left with the idea of what can be done to promote and foster a cooperation in which Nepal comes in as an important ingredient in terms of better ecological management with perhaps harnessing the water and energy and renewable resources which is right now locked into some degree of distrust. And the role perhaps Japan could play along with the United States to be able to really develop this initiative which can make a decisive difference in the life quality of this region. And we have very knowledgeable people here. We have uh, Ronan who, who knows this uh, very well, Tarun. That I thought that this is an idea for which the time is right. Uh, and I say the time is right. We had for the first time uh, a visit of a Nepal Prime Minister to Bihar or just 15 days ago in which he re-articulated Nepal's quest for seeking energy security in the region with better environmental management. I think with some support from Japan and support from the United States, this is one idea I think which can make a tangible difference in the life quality. This is a, this is a new thought of uh, seeking Japan's leadership and involvement in uh, <coughs> developing a particular part of this this region, including Nepal. Uh, Kasai-san, would you like to comment on it in any way, or Taniguchi-san? <laughs> First about the um, Cold War mindset, 
Uh, it is true that when word comes to Japan that you're going to build, develop your fifth generation fighter aircraft, the Russians, you see, not a few people in Tokyo are scratching their heads. <laughs> but I know it takes time for any country to gradually develop its new relationship, the new partner. If you look at Vietnamese, they also uh, imported nuclear powered vessels, uh, submarines from the Russians. But this much is for certain, I can tell you. Uh, no longer the classification that India being an ally to someone else exists in Japan. Your responsibility over Iowa is something that the Japanese cherish most, and your possession of Andaman Nicoba Islands is one of your greatest assets that you have, on which the United States and Japan and parts of the Australians should build assets. So that's the new thinking, I, I can tell you, spreading very much widely among the policy holders in Japan. Now, about water resources. I know it involves very subtle, delicate, difficult policies. And for the Chinese, Japan playing an even-handed, balanced role is not going to be something that they can accept. But again, if you can work with the Japanese, together with the Americans, Nepalese, and I'm not sure Pakistanis, if possible, then try to manage those water resources on which all the South Asian nations' economic prosperity hinge, hinges. <clears throat> I think that's a very good idea. That's worth exploring. Someone who has been very involved with uh, Indo-Japan relations is Ambassador Asrani. Uh, he is sitting there quietly, a uh, very distinguished, silver-haired gentleman. Uh, Ambassador, please come in. Uh, actually, I have the same uh, ideas as N.K. has just mentioned regarding the tremendous contribution that Japan can make in our relations with our neighbors like Nepal and Bangladesh, for example, uh, in both energy and water resources. Uh, I believe that India has a long-term interest in Japan uh, in terms of capital and technology, and now there is an added dimension, and that is security. Uh, and I'm very happy that time and again, we have been re-emphasizing our security agreements. But the latest contribution to this is what was referred to as a relaxation of defense exports from Japan. It will not be a one-way traffic. India can also provide a considerable amount of R&D uh, collaboration in the defense field. And it is also significant for our Japanese friends to note that now in India, the defense sector is being opened up to the private sector. So I look forward to a considerable amount of collaborations in this area. Thank you. We seem to be coming back to defense. Air Chief Marshal Siagi is here. Would you like to comment? I uh, Mike, Mike, Mike is coming to you. Thank you. Uh, I share um, uh, the feeling expressed uh, that we haven't done enough. I believe we need to do much more. And I think some examples were given. We've been at it for now for nearly two decades. And uh, why we should do it has been adequately addressed um, by the panel. But may, maybe some ideas need to be discussed in the trilateral. How we can actually strengthen this. I think um, Ambassador has just mentioned uh, that uh, opening up of the defense industry. But we can't only look at it as the buyer-seller type of relationship. You know, we, we, this uh, transactional uh, relationship has to change into something more substantive. I would like to say that the trilateral really needs to look at, it should not stop at, at pure business transactions. It has to be something deeper. Ambassador Sen, recently our ambassador in Washington, D.C. 
I'm, just, I'm going around the room a little bit and then the panel can respond to. Yeah, uh, just uh, firstly one observation. Uh, talked of the tsunami. In a sense, the tsunami of 2004 was also a watershed. Uh, and at that time, uh, you know, I, I remember, uh, you know, when you had three presidents coming to the embassy, that's uh, President Bush and Laura Bush and uh, his father Bush Sr. and President Clinton. And we're just looking at a map similar to this one which came and had prepared. And I had it upside down, it was facing me, and they were looking at it the other way around. That means from India to the Indian Ocean. And the first remark that he was made by President Clinton at that time, he's saying, I didn't know that you were so close to Indonesia. <coughs> and to the Malacca Straits. And then we looked uh, at it quite differently because we had been looking at far too often it in the context of the continental context, India, Pakistan, and what we are discussing even right now in the continental context of the Indian subcontinent, looking at it in the Indian Ocean. And then we had, after that, the quadrilateral, uh, that is the, uh, the response that the navies of the four countries got involved, the United States, India, Japan, and Australia at that time. The quadrilateral idea was subsequently killed by the United States and Australia, maybe separately and jointly, but the trilateral and blood is continuing. At that time also, Secretary Powell, uh, turned down. I was at that conference where you had a teleconference with the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, who repeatedly was suggesting that China should be also involved in that uh, tsunami relief. It was turned down. Uh, but now the equations are a little bit different, you know, some years down the line since 2004. Uh, but it was not accidental, I just want to say, that in 2005, before the nuclear agreement, the nuclear agreement got a lot of attention. But just a month before that, we had a 10-year framework agreement. I just wanted to say it was not accidental. We worked on it together because, in a sense, because those were the two strategic underpinnings of the relationship. And we have had uneven movement in both these areas. It's still work in progress. And I think that in a short time we have come, I think we have made headway. But one, I fully support what uh, uh, S.G. Marshall said right now. We have to work together and the framework itself envisage, not just you know, buying and selling, but uh, you know, what we just remarked, that we should work together in, in, in a collaborative framework, uh, keeping in mind not just the transactional aspects, but the broader perspective of our relationship. And once it's anchored on that, then it will acquire a strategic dimension. We have not reached that stage yet, and this thinking has not percolated down in the United States, in Japan, just beginning, just beginning on the surface. Uh, and in India also, uh, it is beginning, but I would like to point out again what Secretary Armitage pointed out. And, you know, I remember my first contact with him was when he was in the Pentagon, and I was working with Rajiv Gandhi. And the shift had started actually with Indira Gandhi. And the moment she came to power, that was in 1980, and the beginning of our differences of views with the then Soviet Union was over Afghanistan. We didn't make it public at that time, but it was quite evident. And then decisions were taken again in the defense area that they were going to diversify to Western Europe. So it was a political decision at that time. <coughs> So we are in that process right now and I fully agree also with uh, what uh, a friend uh, who is a great well-wisher of uh, I mean a very strong proponent, I remember at that time also of India-Japan relations, NKC, and, uh, and also of bilateral cooperation between our countries to work in a larger framework and water resources is a framework but you can't take the subcontinent as a whole he suggested Nepal and Bangladesh will fit in because with one, Nepal is an upper riparian and Bangladesh is a lower riparian and then you have an upper riparian, China. This issue also I raised in passing just uh, with, uh, with relation to Brahmaputra. So we can make a beginning there but that links up with Bangladesh, uh, Nepal and links up with ASEAN because Myanmar is our land border for ASEAN. 
So I think it makes sense, rather than to get into a grand project, we can start at looking at the sector. So I would like this to be given consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. With my apologies, I come to you. To the mic, to the gentleman there. Thank you. <coughs> I'm Jem Chopra. Uh, we talked about this trilateral being a good idea. It is. Nine trilaterals. For all the reasons which I don't want to repeat. You all have also mentioned and we also are aware of the other triangle. US, Japan, China. My point is how are these two triangles going to gel? <coughs> India, US, uh, Japan, US, Japan, China. Uh, China is right as we want it to be peaceful. The aim is not to contain, obviously. India, there is no apprehension regarding our rights. The two outsiders, so to say, are India and China. Why not get these four together? The big point I'm making is that in any regional architecture, security, economic, whatever force, uh, China is important because you have more engagement, especially in water, which you're not having at the moment, and less confrontation. And you won't have any demarches by China on this new quad like they had when Australia was there. The second very quick point is, are you influencing the newly formed the track one trilateral, which is at the low JS level? And on defense cooperation, since I am a soldier, I don't think, Mr. Richard Armitage, we should be too disappointed with cooperation with the U.S. Even today, we do the maximum operational exercises in the U.S. And as far as hardware is concerned, through the foreign military say that we bought five, six billion dollars, no tendering, no nothing. We can build on it. But for Japan, I have a request. We are looking for technology, particularly in the private sector. JVs, etc. is okay. Why only is it? Japan has the technology, now that you are slightly loosening your export in the defense sector, we ban from you for this technology. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, General. Thank you. Now let's get back to the panel. There's lots of comments made and some questions. Uh, who would like to take what? Secretary, would you like to come in? <coughs> I accept, uh, notwithstanding your correct comments, sir, I think that I still would pronounce myself as disappointed in the technology area. And I go back not only to the LCA, but right on the heels of that, we made a sale to India of a Cray computer, which at the time was a big deal. Uh, it had enormous capacity that we laugh about today, but at the time it was very important. And it was very difficult for Washington to make the decision uh, because we feared technology transfer to the Soviet Union and our COCOM agreements, etc., were all coming into play. But we were able to make the decision. And uh, my point is, in technology, if we were able to do so much during the Cold War, why haven't we been able to do so much more now? That, that's all. On, on the question of cooperating together or exercising together, I'm all for it. I think it's great. We learn a ton from our Indian friends, and I wouldn't be so uh, brazen as to say our Indian friends learn from us, but I know we, we learn a bunch, and it's great. <coughs> On the other trilaterals, the suggested trilaterals, I would have to say, personally, I'm a skeptic. <laughs> and the reason I'm a skeptic has to do with China's view. I don't think necessarily China wants to get in a room with India, the U.S., and Japan. I don't think China necessarily likes it when the United States, for instance, makes a decision to join the EAS because her, her uh, advantage is when she's doing one-on-one -on -one with other countries, whether it's the United States or anywhere else, it's just because of her size. So I think I'm skeptical about the ability right now uh, because of China's fear of getting involved in this. And I think an American has to say that there is a trust deficit between uh, China and uh, Washington. When Xi Jinping came to Washington a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, uh, they made comments about this. It was acknowledged openly that there is a trust deficit. Uh, but we've got to get in a situation, and I think we are, where we can do business with one another, whether it's government business, business business, uh, or whatever. And uh, so I think we're, we're kind of there. Any other comments? Can I say something? I'll use translate out there. Sure. I think that the world is very important. I think that the world is very important. I think that the world is very important. I think that the 
ことを、まあ、決めなくちゃいけない時期に来てるってことだったんですね。私はその点で、あのアミテリさんに全く賛成です。あの米ソというフレームがなくなった後に、世界は一旦混乱状態になりました。米ソの勝者であるアメリカが唯一のルールメーカーになったグローバルスタンダードが世界を、まあ、よりその統一するんだという議論もありました。And、uh, there were those people who said that、uh, well, the United States、uh, won over the、uh, uh, Soviet Union. So the United States was only going to, going to be the only rule maker and the rule is that the global standards. And uh, uh, so it,、uh, it's going to be the United States state setting the standard for the world. But、uh, we know already that、uh, that was an illusion. The other is that the United States was. 非常にその膨張意欲を明らかにあ,のあらわにして軍備を増強しそしてその一対一の関係で各国に対する影響力を強くして太平洋の西半分を、まあ、影響界に置こうというふうにしているように見えます。Stepping up their military power, and、uh, they are, are trying to. It seems to me that、uh, they are trying to put the、uh, western half of the、uh, Pacific under their influence through one on one dialogue. The Nihon wa, in the side, ni, itai, zibun wa, tai, hei, yo, no, i, chibun, na, no, ka, so, it, mo, Asia, tai, li, no, i, chibun, na, no, ka, to, yu, mo, rek, si, jo, do, to, to, are, ti, ke, to, ki, ta, mon, da, ni, ta, yo, da, ka, na, ke, le, ba, ki, mo, ne. And under those circumstances, I think、uh, Japan has to respond to the question which has been asked、uh, over the years、uh, during our history、um, Is Japan part of、uh, the Pacific Ocean or are we part of the Asian continent? Um, over the past、uh, 2000 years, uh, uh, geopolitically speaking,、uh, Japan has、uh, fa- always faced a、uh, face of threat、uh, coming from the continent、uh, through the、uh, Korean Peninsula. And in this case, the United States and 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 the United States. And so it was uh, uh, based on this thinking that、uh, we had、uh, the Anglo Japanese alliance and、uh, we became,、uh, we cooperated with the United States and、uh, we defeated the Qing dynasty in the Sino Japanese War and、uh, also fought and won the Arapaho Japanese War. その後ですね、日本では日本アジアの一部である、東アジアの一部であるという考え方が強くなってきまして。日本が海の一部であるという考え方が退いていくという時期がありました。それが最終的には太平洋戦争に結びついて、日本は大変不幸な敗戦に導いたわけです。And, uh, and uh, not really part of the、uh, maritime community. And I think、uh, that was the、uh, kind of a r r o g a n t thinking, perception within Japan, which、uh, ultimately led to our loss,、uh, our entering the Pacific War and、uh, our defeat. The Chimok was the most important thing to do in Japan, and it was the most important thing to do in Japan. It was the most important thing to do in Japan, and it was the most important thing to do in Japan. アメリカとの関係が非常にしっかりしたものであったときに初めて隣人としての中国は極めてリズナブルでジェントルな隣人になるということは火を見るように明らかです。
And uh, um, so um, Ch China is our most important uh, neighbor, and uh, that goes, goes without saying. So it's uh, extremely important that uh, we get along uh, okay with China. But uh, in doing so, I think uh, it is important to stress that uh, the uh, maritime, um, our uh, relationship in the maritime community, well, in the past it was the United, uh, United Kingdom, but uh, more recently with uh, our relationship with the United States needs to be very solid in order to um, have, uh, in order to maintain China as a reasonable and gentle neighbor. それはその領土問題についても経済問題についても日米同盟がしっかりしている限りにおいて中国はあ日本にとってみたらリーズナブルなリーズになっていくんでしょう。So whether it be our territorial issues or economical issues, as long as uh, the U.S.-Japan alliance is solid and strong, I think that China will continue to be a reasonable neighbor for us. ところがですね、ちょうどこのトライナテラルが始まった頃、日本の中ではアメリカじゃなくて。中国、韓国、日本で東アジア共同体を作ろうというその間違った考え方がまあかなりその影響力を持ち始めておりました。But uh, right about the time when this uh, trilateral dialogue started, uh, uh, there was a, a, a sentiment within Japan uh, which uh, was a uh, um, uh, which uh, placed importance on our relationship between uh, China and uh, Korea to create an East Asian community um, without the United States between these, uh, but uh, with uh, China and Korea. And uh, this uh, thinking uh, has uh, gained some influence. あ、価値の面で言うと自由主義、民主主義といった共通項を持つところがまあ、大陸の中国とうまく折り合っていくために協力をするということが絶対必要であるということからスタートしたものだと思います。I think uh, the uh, basic thinking behind uh, the trilateral dialogue, uh, which started just around that time, is uh, that uh, um, the um, uh, there is, there is, we need to cooperate with uh, um, with our countries with uh, that uh, we share the same kind of values. In terms of values, it's a li liberal democracy, and uh, we have a lot of uh, commonalities. And in terms of the geopolitics uh, of the nations which are in the Pacific and uh, the Indian Ocean, you know, uh, if we have that uh, cooperative re relationship, uh, then uh, we would uh, find a way in order to uh, deal with uh, China uh, in a smooth manner. さ、uh, fortunately, the uh, illusion of the East Asian community uh, faded um, as time elapsed, and uh, currently the uh, mainstream uh, Japanese uh, um, atmosphere is uh, shifting towards TPP and the cooperation between the uh, United States and India. まあ、uh, so I think uh, that uh, um, in terms of uh, pursuing specific projects, I think uh, that's uh, one step beyond the uh, trilateral um, scope of the trilateral dialogue. Um, but uh, the function of the trilateral dialogue is to pave way or to create an environment for that to happen. And I think the point was right. I'm not sure if that answers my uh, question, answers your question or not. I just uh, share with you my views. Thank you, Katai san. I think this was a very, very clear and detailed exposition and, and very welcome. Mike, you wanted to cover. John, if I could just comment on a few of the really excellent uh, suggestions for agenda items. Um, on the proposal that we, and specifically Japan, play a role in the Himalayas and the fall. Um, I think Tanigushi san makes a good point. This would be real sensitivity for our Chinese friends. But of course, we could also do it through the Asia Development Bank, where Japan's a leader, or the World Bank. 
Um, and uh, it is certainly, I think, worth considering. Um, there's quite a bit of expertise in Tokyo on water development and water technology. In the private sector and in the universities, as the ambassador knows, they could be tapped into for this. <laughs> on the Air Marshal's point about being more ambitious, I mean, if we were ambitious, we might think about um, how we could achieve a kind of federated capability of ISR, surveillance, among the maritime states. The U.S. just um, mothballed its um, older generation of Global Hawk. So they're sitting, I think, at Hickam Air Force Base in boxes. Uh, Japan has excess capacity right now uh, for their excellent P-3s and, um, and first-rate indigenously made um, seaplanes. <coughs> um, if we think about the Indo-Pacific, um, these are all instruments of transparency and confidence building. If we were ambitious, we would think of ways to lease equipment, to share equipment, uh, maybe uh, with the Global Hawks, the Air Force flies them two days a week, the Pan flies them two days a week, maybe they could use um, HMAS Sterling in Western Australia, maybe Nicobar and Andaman. While some of this technology would be sensitive, it could be shared with maritime nations, perhaps including China. That's the kind of way we would be thinking if we were ambitious. Uh, Roman said and reminded me of those extremely intense and difficult days after the uh, Boxing Day tsunami. And I remember um, Kofi Annan's proposal that we include China. And I remember why Secretary Powell didn't want these relationships. Um, which gets to Rich's point about the trilateral. Secretary Clinton has proposed a trilateral US-Japan, China to the uh, Chinese friends. In general, Beijing is turning these down and refusing them. The PLA doesn't want that kind of proximity with other militaries. Uh, the leadership doesn't want a multilateral, or really doesn't want a minilateral framework. They prefer broad multilateral or bilateral. Uh, from my perspective, for that very reason, we should keep asking. <laughs> we should keep asking. And we'll see. Maybe Xi Jinping will have a somewhat different view on these things. Um, but it doesn't work for us to keep, uh, keep, keep checking and seeing uh, what the Chinese temperature is on these things. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let me just remind you that uh, the Japanese-U.S. relationship has been guided by some of the fine minds who are, no coincidence, ex-Navy <coughs> people, which Army Page, Poco Patterson. Um, all those people who made a difference in the U.S.-Japan relationship have somehow uh, had close relationships with the naval connection. And that shows that the U.S. Navy and the Japanese Maritime Self Navy are two navies that are closer than anyone else. Why don't you join us? <laughs> Why don't the Indian Navy join this group to safeguard the maritime traffic, which is a precious common goods? I think we are ready. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador Bajpai, Ambassador to Washington, to Beijing, to Islamabad, and, and a member of many of our strategic dialogues. <laughs> well, it's uh, very gracious of it. Actually, have you to ask me, I'm afraid I missed the earlier part of the discussion, but uh, my own involvement with the Japanese relations happened to be in the uh, mid 80s when it started to acquire a certain measure of content. I remember, I'm not sure it was in this room, but in something similar. Your then foreign minister, Sakarauchi, son, said very explicitly that Japan's relationships with India had been conditioned by Japan's relationships with the United States. And as long as India had a somewhat equivocal relationship with the United States, Indo-Japan relations became limited. But now that the United States are talking at that time has started to develop a new relationship with India, Japan is ready to do so. I think it was a very candid and a very uh, basic approach which I think will continue to guide our relationship. We must recognize the vital significance of the Japan-US relationship. And our relationship, I think, with Japan is also to some extent going to be determined by our relationship with the United States. I believe that we are on the right path, but we need to do a lot more on both fronts. Thank you. Ambassador Jha, would you like to make a comment or put a question? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I have an observation to make, which uh, I think I have a question accompanying it, which perhaps our Japanese colleague on the Pen Distinguished Panel would like to deal with. There is another grouping in Asia, as you are aware, the SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Now, it seems to me that the closer our ties develop, the three, the trilateral grouping, India, Japan, and the United States, the more they will, the Chinese will try to sow seeds of suspicion about this grouping in the minds of the other, other countries who are involved in that, especially Russia. Uh, in that context, keeping this in mind, I might we are not members of that, we are only observers there. In that context, is it possible to give us an idea about what is the exact state of your relationship with Russia now? I am aware of the differences of the White Islands. But is it improving or has it been put on the back burner? How does it go? Because if there is an the element of relaxation there, then I feel that any Chinese efforts in the future in this direction would not lead to much success. Thank you. Thank you. The matter of the exact state uh, of our relationship with Russia right now is not good. No, Japan, Japan's relationship with Russia. Japan. Uh, well, well, let's take USA first and then we'll take Russia. Japan, yes. The exact state of US-Russia is not good and in my view cannot improve until after the March elections, presidential elections. Uh, right now, uh, whether rightly or wrongly, we're being scapegoated quite loudly and I think part of it is because of the surprise in Moscow uh, for Mr. Putin that there were actually other views in Moscow. Uh, but right now, I don't look for much movement at all in, in U.S. Uh, uh, Russian relations. I, there are small glimmers that things are getting better, uh, more reasonable discussions on the question of Syria uh, than before, the ability to at least get some press statements out that are not blocked by the Russians and for that matter by the Chinese, but the general matter, our relationships are not good right now. The one point though, uh, if I start it, I believe 70% of your supplies to your forces in Afghanistan are in fact transiting through that area. So if relationship was on that back, perhaps it would not, this would not be possible. On the SCO? No, no this is uh, your supply. No, supply is my supply. Your forces in Afghanistan are going through this territory, this very area, Russia, the, 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 the Central Asian countries. So obviously the relationship with Russia perhaps is not as bad as one imagines. Otherwise it would not be possible. Danny, <laughs> Uh, Japan has been an insular nation, an island nation, but it's been uh, surrounded by three, uh, many times hostile, oftentimes unfriendly nuclear powers, China, North Korea, Russia. And there's something in common between the Russians and the Chinese. They're extremely proud peoples, but their selves have been injured by their own historical backgrounds. So they are eager to get something back, to be proud of themselves. So we're faced with a, uh, a couple of bear and dragon that have growing pains. This is a danger zone. That's the reason why Japan has got to tie itself more firmly with like-minded maritime democracies. This is part of that exercise. That said, President Putin, if he makes it, uh, seems to be determined to take the Russians up to the next stage. And in order for it to happen, the vastly unpopulated area of Siberia has got to be developed with the help of someone else. Who is that someone else going to be? Americans, Japanese, possibly Koreans. So there's going to be an opportunity down the road in the next decade for the Japanese to be able to pull levers, strings, in order for the long-standing issues to be uh, getting closer to a solution. And Russians um, are going to be extremely important in the sense that Arctic navigation route also is going to be a focal point in our life. So, uh, in order for the Russians, the Americans, the Canadians, and the Japanese to <coughs> safeguard that passage area as well, we need to speak uh, much, much more intensely together. But let me just stress 
no matter what subject matter, no matter what uh, task that Japan's diplomacy has to, has to shoulder, it's better for the Japanese uh, to utilize the intellectual capital, diplomatic, dip, diplomatic capital that the Japanese has developed with Americans and with India. Ambassador Kudit Sadev has been our ambassador in Tokyo for several years. Kudit, would you like to come in? Yeah, well, I would uh, basically like to support some of the suggestions that have been made, especially about Nepal, uh, with the comment that uh, you know, it was suggested that maybe Pakistan would be brought in. I think it's always good to involve Pakistan in traditional dialogue, but uh, in this particular case, they really have, will have no interest because none of these rivers flow into Pakistan. They all flow into Bangladesh and as Raman said, Bangladesh would be a good addition to any such project. And uh, the development of energy and environment in Nepal has been held up for decades, primarily because of the trust deficit. They don't trust India to develop it in their interests. And uh, we don't like anybody else getting involved. I think this mindset has to change. Japan certainly could be a major contributor to unlocking this. And I think maybe America's involvement would be also very welcome because uh, the trust deficit would become that much less. So that certainly is a very, very uh, good suggestion by NK and I think we are, this group should actively pursue this. Uh, Japan has been involved in some other major flagship kind of projects which are changing some of the perceptions, especially the Bombay-Delhi uh, industrial corridor, the dedicated freight corridor, which will lead to huge developments, huge benefits all along the way. Uh, when I was there, I remember the, one of the primary preoccupations one had, and I think that probably uh, Arjun and uh, HK would uh, say to support that, was how to get the Japanese more interested in investing in India, because it was always so much below potential. And uh, Arjun coined a phrase uh, there was a mental distance between Japan and India. Uh, I think that that became just an excuse rather than uh, a real reason. There, there were real, some of the Japanese were not interested in it anymore. And I always felt that the change will be led by industry and not by government. And I think that is precisely what is beginning to happen. The Japanese industry started realizing the uh, opportunities that they were missing and things have started changing and have changed a long way. Uh, and I, I like to think that the trilateral dialogue is a great contributor to this process. Which is a very good Thank, you. Thank you very much, Kudeep. Any comments, any responses to any of the comments from the floor? <laughs> I think NK, you have kind of uh, kept up to your reputation of putting a big idea on the table. He was uh, the central figure in um, launching our highway program across the country uh, 12 years ago and the other very big idea uh, which really connected the country was the telecom, telecom revolution. So uh, perhaps the time has come for Bihar, Nepal, Bangladesh all to come together with Japan in, I think Japan could play a very, very significant role in bringing the countries of the region together. Any final comments from panel members before we conclude and I invite everybody for lunch. Uh, Hemant, why don't I start with you? Uh, thank you. Uh, Tarun, I'd, I'd just like to say that uh, the points about uh, enhancing defense cooperation forward are very relevant. And yes, there, are, there is work to be done on all sides. Uh, all three countries. So on, on the US side, putting together a framework for India-specific event transfers, uh, which uh, 
incrementally takes care of the technology sharing aspect. From the Indian side, how do you actually, are you comfortable with giving foreign companies majority control exactly. if they invest in defense production? That's my question to you. That's exactly the point. So or are you only wanting to give them 26%? No, no. If I'm you not. want their technology. Look, the simple point is, if we can buy planes which are made 100% in a plant in another country, why, why can't we give that company 100% control over a plant in India and make those, those planes for us? But these, these, these are, uh, so I, I was coming exactly to that. We need to, uh, we need to make it possible for that kind of technology transfer to happen. There's a lot of new thinking required at our end too. And Japan has made this new start on, uh, on uh, uh, easing its uh, defense transfer uh, regulations. That also gives, opens up initially uh, an, uh, a, let's say, a, a potential possibility of moving towards uh, defense uh, collaboration with India. On the overall concept of the relationship, I think, I, I should think that the trilaterals should make all of you focus a little bit more about India's future in the East. That is Asia, actually. And that is the most productive, uh, we, these are the most productive economies uh, uh, in the globe over the next 40 years. The more we integrate with these economies, the better it will be for us. And Japan will definitely be playing an important role, not just uh, in helping infrastructure here, but in connecting us institutionally with uh, the countries to the east of us. Finally, I mean, I, there was some comment about the past and how we used to relate uh, to each other especially in the Cold War. And uh, uh, that reminded me uh, of a comment which, uh, which Mike Green made last year when he was despairing a little bit about mm. our relations. And uh, he, uh, he happened to write something which said that, <laughs> look, I mean, these guys, you know, the Japanese and the Indians, they're not, not quite pulling uh, uh, their weight. And they're not quite delivering on the kind of security cooperation which uh, we want each of them to do. But you know, there's only India and Japan we have. So if, <laughs> if, if, we, if we paraphrase that in today's context and answer the questions raised by NK and, and by, by Ambassador Vajpayee, uh, in today's context, you know, sometimes the Americans will say, well, the Japanese are really starting to look a little bit of India sometimes. And the Indians are never quite going to look like what the Japanese used to look like. <coughs> and America itself eventually is going to be accommodating both these critical partners to make this a successful trilateral. So I think I'll leave you with that thought uh, in, in that context. Thank you very much. Mike? It was meant as a compliment. <laughs> um, and I wrote that with Dan Poining uh, in the Washington Post. Um, no, very briefly, one of the drivers for this trilateral relationship, uh, which we didn't mention today, but everyone I think is aware of, is nuclear yeah. cooperation, nuclear power. Um, we uh, uh, in the U.S. have made, I think, good progress with India on some of our concerns. Japan and India still have progress that needs to be made on a peaceful nuclear cooperation agreement. And as we discussed in our sessions this morning, Japan's decisions on nuclear power after Fukushima will have a very uh, deep impact on our American and Indian public debates yeah. and confidence. So I just thought I'd put that out before we conclude because that really was one of the main drivers. We recognize that with Westinghouse GE, Toshiba Hitachi, the U.S. Japan and India really uh, have an uh, intertwined strategic, technological, and political relationship on nuclear power. Thank you, Mike. I think that's just right. And uh, we, we are committed to a clean energy, nuclear energy development program. So thank you for highlighting that, Gautam. Uh, just two things. Uh, one is uh, you know, we know this in, in our prior bilateral we've been discussing that. Uh, the United States has a civil nuclear deal that was a big game changer. With Japan, we have the DMIC, and that's been a, a big, big investment. And today, I think uh, uh, Ms. Singh has made a, the first trilateral suggestion, which is Japan, India, US. Let's look at Nepal. Let's look at water resources. And I think that's a, that's a that's a reflection of where I think we need to go. And in terms of what Mike said, uh, in terms of ambition, on the defense procurement side, uh, I actually uh, probably. Uh, will 100% endorse what uh, what Heyman said. I thought uh, Indian business was against giving majority I, control. I think, I think Indian business needs to grow up to the reality of what it takes to develop defense technology, how long it takes, 
what is the relationship between the armed forces and, and their requirements and the development of technology uh, and in terms of what do you want to focus on? Are you going to buy a platform technology that is valid for the next five years and look at what you need 25 years from now? Or are you going to debate what you need 25 years from now and not even get what you want for the next five years? And I think we don't, we don't seem to understand this too much. We look at it as a business opportunity. Uh, and the final part when you talk about defense, who is the procurement, uh, who are you uh, procuring for? You're procuring for the armed forces, which is a limited program. All right. uh, how many private sector companies in this country are going to go out and spend billions of dollars on a, procurement, on a procurement program that says I want to buy 126 aircraft and we don't know what's going to happen after that. And I think that we need to start dialing some of this thinking and understand that you need the platform technology and then you need joint ventures probably below that to look at the next generation of defense technologies that you need to develop off that platform technology and then you do the intellectual property sharing discussions. Yes, there are framework issues out there. Yes, there are issues on the Indian procurement side. Yes, there are issues on technology transfer you know, still uh, from the US side. But I think we need to get a lot more realistic that 50, 60 years after independence, we don't have a defense industry in this country worth its name, except at a very, very low tech level. And if you want to get to the high tech level, you need to first go out and understand how this whole thing works before you can turn around and say, I've lost an opportunity of being an opportunity. Thank you. I think that's very, very good and very realistic and I think also very nationalistic. Gatsai-san. まあ、コストセットと言ってますから、今インドの政府と日本の政府でインフラの整備をお手伝いしようとやってます。それに対して我々できるだけ自分の持っている技術とかシステムインテグレーションを提供していきたいと思います。Uh, uh, um, we operate quite big well and uh, between the Indian and Japanese governments uh, there's a big discussion in terms of uh, improving Indian infrastructure and uh, we would like to uh, do our best and uh, help uh, to the uh, best we can in terms of uh, with our technology and our system uh, integration. Secretary Amitid. When you get to this age, you look like I do, you don't have many conceits. But I think a conceit that we all can have is that for a while our, uh, our what, what sustained us as a trilateral, I think, was getting off the ground the track one trilateral. And I think we succeeded. I think we gave our respective governments sufficient confidence that they were willing to engage in this and now they'll continue on. So it leaves me to point this, that the suggestions we heard about picking something that matters and sort of sharpening our or the point on our arrow here to try that out is something that's not only right, but it'll sort of even rekindle the spirit that we started with. I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong. I think we've been great, but I really think that's the, that's the next level. To pick a target and go for it and try to get our government there. So I'm grateful for the suggestion. Thank you very much. Danny, would you As was said famously by Lord Palmerston, uh, no alliance can live forever. What is eternal is your national interest. Uh, with all the ups and downs and good times and bad times between the United States and Japan, these two nations have chosen to tie together based on their own national interest calculus. I think there is ample room for the Indians and the Japanese to do that. That said, the calculation, the sheer calculation can be enriched by the friendship and a year ago, uh, about this time, it felt as if Japan was stabbed by a gigantic knife and it was bleeding hard. And it was then, almost instinctively, the Marine Corps members, naval persons, peoples, and Air Force members, the United States, uh, United States military initiated the biggest ever, the biggest ever peacetime operation to rescue the Japanese. And it touched a lot of Japanese because those young men and women in uniform shed tears together with the tsunami speaking people. But I have to say, for the first time ever, the Indian government sent your fine rescue team to the Japanese, albeit small in scale. They were so hard. And when they came back to India, 
They gave a press conference to the Japanese network TVs. And I saw them being immensely touched as well by the hardship, but by the resilience of the tsunami stricken people. You know, those are the images that will persist and that will bring a lot of uh, people, uh, a lot of memories to a lot of people in Japan that when Japan was down in the 1950s, it was the Indians <coughs> who gave warm support to the Japanese. It was even you, the Indians, who gave back the sense of pride to the Japanese by accepting the first ever official developmental assistance that the Japanese government chose to give overseas. So, um, I think um, Ambassador Sin has uh, said this many times, the sky is the only limit. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you panel and thank you my two co-chairs, Satai San and Secretary Amitin and thank you all of you for being here, for participating and please join us for lunch. I think the trilateral seems to be in good shape, work in progress, more to be done and Mr. N.K. Singh has given us a new chance. Thank you very much.